In 2005, two Western Australians were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine, and that was for their discovery of the Helobacter pylori and its role in the gastric, gastri, gastritis and pelt. No, um, got to read this. Anyway, read. it is Perfect being presented by Absolutely. a funny-shaped <laughs> orange balloon this morning. So stay tuned. Very interesting. Very on interesting. That. <laughs> so joining us now is one of those Nobel Prize laureates, Professor Barry Marshall. Thank you, Barry, for joining us. Yeah, morning, Matt. Morning, Good morning. Eddie. <laughs> so the the bacteria. Apparently, it's my understanding of the, of the history of this is that no one believed that in the medical world that a bacteria could possibly exist in the mm. stomach area. Mm. So what against all of that? sort of background history made you believe that the possibly what could live? Well, we, our research was just curiosity because Dr. Warren had seen these bacteria and I'm showing you a picture of them. Helicobacter I means spiral or helic okay. helicopter bacteria, a lot of people <laughs> call them. It's a lot of easy, it's easy to remember. But the teaching was that you didn't have any bacteria in your stomach because they couldn't live there. It was too much acid. It's okay. digesting your food, obviously it digests bacteria. So. When Dr. Warren saw these, we said, hey, hey, that's weird. Let's try and find out what they are, a new kind of bacteria. Mm. And we were saying, oh, gee, maybe they're only in Western Australia. Maybe you catch them off kangaroos or something, <laughs> you know, the real Aussie bacteria. But then it went on and we found out that about half the people in the whole world are infected with these. And you practically have to have the bacteria in your stomach to get ulcers. Mm -hmm. And so that you could, ha if you didn't have the bacteria, we found that you could have as much stress, you could do everything bad, and you would never get an ulcer. Mm -hmm. But if you did have them, well then you're susceptible to things like, I don't know, medications, to you know, cigarette smoking, and just for no reason you would get ulcers. An ulcer's a uh, little hole in the lining of the stomach, and you could have a hemorrhage, need a blood transfusion, have surgery, your whole life could be you know, spoiled by it because whenever you had a meal, you're getting this pain in your stomach. So people with ulcers used to be very, very cranky. Everyone said, oh, that's the ulcer personality, they're stressed out. But we found out that it was the ulcer problem that was causing them to feel stressed, not the other way around. And so one thing led to another after that. You, you had a lot of trouble convincing people. I think in 1998, mm. uh, you were quoted as saying something along the lines of, you know, um, well, everyone was against me, but I knew I was right. So, <laughs> Dr. Marshall, what made you so sure that you were right well, against well, the we, odds? Well, f the first thing, we studied the literature and we found out that people had discovered these bacteria several times in the past hundred years, but really were not looking for a cause for ulcers and they just ignored them. They went on and did some other thing in their career and, and only published one paper. Um, but the second thing is to prove that they could infect healthy people and cause this irritation in the stomach. I did an experiment where I drank the bacteria and then you know I was throwing up and but we put the tube down me and uh, took some samples and showed that the bacteria could just infect healthy people. So the bacteria came first and then the ulcers developed and it wasn't the situation that everyone was saying where people with ulcers just got harmless bacteria. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we've moved on a long way. I mean, firstly, I'll say that it's fantastic winning the Nobel Prize and Dr. Warren and I have just had a bomb of a time ever since it happened. Uh, there are a few other people uh, in the waiting in the wings from Australians who could potentially win the Nobel Prizes. So we're making hay while the, while the sun shines. We reckon there'll be a few more Nobel Prize winners in Australia very shortly, next few years. I'm fascinated in a minute to hear a little bit more about what you're doing from as a result of your research. But one other thing that also fascinates me is that throughout history, you know, our, our history books are littered with the person who challenges conventional wisdom and is almost mm. called a heretic and I, I hear that that's exactly the situation that you face. How does one face the cynicism and the scepticism of the, the global oh. conventional wisdom? And especially proving it to the other medical staff as well. Well I saw a quote, from, I can't remember who it was, uh, Seneca or some Roman or Greek and he said, uh, don't expect your children to do what you want them to do because they were born in a different time. And so the moral like of the story that. is the new generation comes up they see the world differently than I did. My kids have a different uh, approach to everything. And so we're all standing back, oh, geez, they should be more careful and they should save more money, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, they are probably doing the right thing for, for their generation. And so they will make new discoveries and, and probably tackle the problems uh, in a different way. And we're actually seeing that in medicine, lots of new technology, biotechnology. There's booming in Western Australia in the mining industry because 
what we did in the 60s and 70s when it boomed the first time, there's new technology out there and I'm seeing a mining boom and there's all kinds of new technology out there. It's being done totally differently this generation. Mm. So it was really a massive confidence that you had a new view on the Yeah, you can expect the old guys yeah. who, are already, who already have an investment in the current status quo mm. to be coming up with the new yeah. ideas and the radical new discoveries as young people, people uh, who haven't got any investment in the status quo and they're going to say there must be a, a better way of doing this if I could just get into that niche and then they'll make a discovery that you hadn't thought of and so that it's always a, there's always a bit of scepticism. Mm. But do you think nowadays, as more things are being discovered, people are becoming less sceptical because they're more open in their ideas about what can be discovered? Well, actually, uh, because, uh, because of the internet and communications, uh, in Western Australia it was a you know, small place and you, you couldn't find a lot of people who could really say whether, it was, whether they had the right idea or not. <coughs> you used to have to go overseas. Nowadays, you get on the internet, you get on your internet phone calls, you're talking to people and you've got a lot of communication and you can get input from international experts just from while you're in Perth. And so it's so much easier now to be global and international from Western Australia. So the information is a lot more available to us here in Perth and around WA, but hmm. um, so you find that your job is easier having that Well, I s what I'd say is that people who make a new discovery trying to do something new don't expect it to be easy because there are lots and lots of ideas out there and the investors and the people who actually you need to support you, they want, they want to see a bit of competition out there and the top performers float to the top. I mean, they cannot help everybody. So they say, you guys have got to battle it out and, and we'll say, that looks like a fantastic new idea from Western Australia. Let's go for that one. But you, you know, we can't support all of them. There's a lot of investors out there nowadays. A lot of people make money in Western Australia already and they would be investing in biotech, engineering, any kind of new mm. uh, discoveries or research. Dr Marshall, you hinted earlier that having won the Nobel Prize, you're not sitting and resting on your laurels, <laughs> so to speak. What's yeah. coming up next for, for your research? Well, Dr Warren and I are trying to win the next one. We're, it's, it's much more fun to win the second one because you're more experienced. <laughs> but uh, what we're doing is, here's our helicobacter and all. Yes, that's what Canyon I wanted to know. Exactly this is what about. it looks like. They're not as big as this. Of course, they're <laughs> <Thank minuscule. goodness. laughs> um, But what we're doing is I have a vaccine company called Ondek and, we, and you say so you've got in the bacteria, you've got your DNA mm -hmm. and there's a bacterial DNA and we're cloning in other kinds of DNA. So this week with horse flu, uh, we would say, this is 10 years from now, we would have cloned in some horse flu DNA within a week or two and then we would ultimately be uh, making a helicobacter with a horse flu uh, vaccine sticking on its side and all the horses, you just squirt it down their throats and they'd all be vaccinated. So that's, that's where we're going to be in 10 or 15 years from now, but that's the work we're doing here in Perth. So your research has essentially opened up a whole new way of creating vaccines very quickly. That's right, because these Fantastic. bacteria control your immune system. You cannot get rid of them. Uh, so we would uh, make something like a, a yogurt with these things in it and it would irritate the lining of your stomach and maybe infect you for a couple of weeks and you could be vaccinated then against whatever we stuck on the side of it. And so avian flu, we think a few years from now it shouldn't be any problem. Everybody would just buy the vaccine in the supermarket. Well, certainly <laughs> taking a vaccine by swallowing some yoghurt um, with your breakfast that we're going to yeah. hear back from Peter Kenyon later sounds a lot more attractive than <laughs> lining up the needles every week. That's right. The problem yeah. with things like flu vaccine is that adults have to take them. Everybody's happy to give their kids needles, <laughs> but when it comes to getting a needle yourself, you're certainly a bit nervous about that. So now you've, you did just win the Nobel Prize. Tell us what you've got coming up in the future with your future ambitions for the next Nobel Prize. Well, uh, potentially this type of technology means that uh, if we could get it right, and it's a very difficult project, so it'll take a few years, uh, you would be able to vaccinate people just for a few cents. And you'd be able to have a vaccine that only takes a month or two to make instead of a year. Okay. And so that uh, in people in Africa, they might be getting able to get vaccines against malaria, tuberculosis, HIV. You know, they're, they're the, that's the holy grail, if you like. Mm for vaccines and I can tell you there are dozens of vaccine companies around the world trying to get the new technology. This business of making vaccines in chicken eggs, 
mm. you know, that, that was invented by McFarlane Burnett and his friends back in the 30s, 40s and 50s. Well, it sounds absolutely like a fantastic vision to have, to be able to make it cheap, cost-effective and accessible to the whole world's community. So we wish you well and hope that there's another Nobel Prize coming up very, very soon. Absolutely, and I think the world needs more people like you in it. <laughs> absolutely. Finding, I don't finding know finding oh, congratulations <laughs> on your first Nobel Prize as well. Oh, so yeah. Thanks for joining us, Dr Marshall. We look forward to having you again for your second Nobel Prize. Okay, no worries.